Welcome to Heaven and Earth. I'm Wyatt Graham, and I'm joined by Michael Lynch. And we're going to talk probably about various things, but in particular about his recent Oxford University Press book on hypothetical universalism. So as we get going, Michael, can you just introduce yourself in a way that probably makes sense for this conversation? Sure. Um, as uh, you said, my name is Michael Lynch. I teach um, at a classical school here in Delaware, uh, the state that you um, drive through to get to Philadelphia. Um, yeah, it's called Delaware Valley Classical School. I teach Latin and Greek there, um, also rhetoric. Um, I got my PhD um, at Calvin Seminary, which is uh, the book that you just mentioned was my dissertation now published. From there, um, Lyle Bierma was actually my doctoral advisor. Um, anyways, so yeah. Did you study, I mean, I guess he would have been there, Richard Mahler, was he there? He was obviously at the same time because you've Correct. About him, but. Yeah, in, yeah, in fact, so the my first year that I arrived at uh, my PhD program, I found out that Dr. Mueller was retiring. Mm. I took every class that I could from him, uh, my first and second year of coursework. Um, in fact, I didn't even have a course with uh, Dr. Birma, uh, but Dr. Mueller wasn't taking any more PhD students on to advise them through their PhD or through their dissertation. Um, so anyways, so I, I instead had Dr. Birma um, do that for me and he was great. Now, um, if someone doesn't know like Richard Mueller is, is I, I mean, there's, there's a lot of guys doing work, but he started, I would say doing some really high level work with the primary sources, organizing early kind of modern reformed, I guess after and scholastic thinking. If you could give like like the two minute kind of elevator pitch about who he is, because I think if someone doesn't know who that is, then um, it might be useful to know because he has some pretty wonderful material out there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Dr. Mueller is most well known um, for his four volume Reform Dogmatics, uh, the Post Reformation Reform Dogmatics. I have it back there. Um, he was a student at Duke um, with. Uh, who did he study under? Uh, the name is escaping me at the moment. Calvin in context, Luther in context, Steinmetz. Steinmetz. Yeah. yeah, Steinmetz. He was a student of Steinmetz, and Steinmetz himself was a student of Heiko Obermann. There's this, there's this, um, uh, there's this genealogy uh, between Heiko Obermann um, and then David Steinmetz and then Richard Muller that has really um, solidified a strong objective historiography that emphasizes the original sources, that emphasizes uh, the original languages. Uh, hold on, can we time out for a moment? Uh, all right. So we just had a, a brief uh, break, family members running the room, which is actually does happen. I have another podcast, my friend Ian Clary and I do one on, uh, right now we're reading through John Calvin's Institute. So we have had it happen, both of us. And, and, I, and I don't edit his out because I think it's funny to leave his distractions in Yeah, because <laughs> I'm the editor. Mine was coming in, the, when the second one came in pantless, I thought that was a good time to maybe- uh, <laughs> To maybe upgrade it, yeah. yeah. We, we could kind of clip that out if we, for the video for YouTube <laughs> or whatever. So, um, okay, so we were talking, yeah, so yeah, we had, we're talking about Richard Muller. We we're talking about Eric Stein, uh, David Steinmetz, David rather, Steinmetz. Yeah. and Heiko Obermann, who are kind of like, I would say, giants in sort of reformed history, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, and they each got a little bit narrower. So whereas uh, Obermann really was a master um, promulgator and historian of basically the whole Reformation, including into like the medieval period, Steinmetz was a little bit more just kind of on Protestantism. And then Muller has kind of found his niche over the years in, I think, as you mentioned, scholasticism in particular. So they've each, um, they each kind of, uh, Muller has uh, narrow it, uh, narrowed the history a little bit, uh, focused more narrowly on reform theology, especially scholasticism and trying to argue that scholasticism has gotten a bad rap or whatever, yeah. When you read them, you can tell the difference, but like, uh how to put it when you read them you know that they know the people they're talking about 
there's a sense yeah. citation their sources are the original sources themselves yeah yeah and we were talking about this before recording but you talk about richard Mueller. just the idea that you need to read the actual source material yeah he he didn't like surveys very much for that reason he thought that when people wrote surveys of a massive amount of kind of you know trying to do a history from uh, I don't know, from uh, the death of Jesus Christ to uh, 1500 AD and just kind of survey of theology or a survey of history. He, he just thought that no one, at least no normal human being, could master that material such that they could do a very able job at it. And so this is why I think that you see Muller writing on such, especially nowadays, on such narrow uh, subjects, because he realized that everywhere you go, there's a massive amount of literature that needs to be, I, we're not even talking about secondary literature, right, uh, which, which Muller reads, uh, but primary literature, the, the original sources, there's just a massive amount to have to digest before one is competent to write on that subject. So he was very weary uh, in, in, in my coursework, he was very he expressed great weariness about the judgment of surveys in general. Yeah, that almost kind of segues into to your book because you wrote a book on Jan, John Davenant and his work on hypothetical universalism. Yeah, right. It segues there. Well, actually, you do a long survey from the beginning of church well, history. Well, yes, oh, yes, but on but, a very narrow yeah, question, I, right? But but what I was trying to get at was that. Uh, you're you're kind of uncovering something in history that maybe a lot of people have missed or have wrongly understood so i told you i looked at the wikipedia page and it on this topic and it's tiny but it says something to the effect that hypothetical universalism is is not really viewed as being calvinistic like it's outside of the reformed world yeah. and yet I, I suspect you would say that's not true <laughs> yes uh well if, it, if the Wikipedia page said it, that it's viewed as being not reformed, well, there's plenty of people that view it that way. In fact, this is what my first chapter is all about, is that historiography, by and large, has treated hypothetical universalism as a view that is a via media or a middle way between um, reformed theology on the one hand and something like Arminianism on the other. Uh, some suggest that it was self-consciously trying to be a via media, and then others would say, well, maybe they weren't trying to be, it just ended up that way. So in either case, uh, it's really kind of a middle way between Calvinism and Arminianism or something like that. But uh, yeah, no. Are those two distinct I, views? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Calvinism and Arminianism, yeah. like the, the two things that are very stable and exactly one thing each? Well, yeah, I mean, there's diversity between those yeah. views too. I'm sure I don't know, babe. right? Um, yeah, but but no, I mean, you are right that they they're they're pretty distinct in their impulses. But yeah, I, I think I think people have seen in hypothetical universalism, Arminian impulses sometimes, and Calvinistic impulses at other times, and therefore this is the way that they describe it. This is the way that they're seeing that history, and and. And my book is trying to say that that's not really accurate, right? I mean, it's just not accurate. Um, it, it could be accurate for certain theologians in the period, but it's not accurate with respect to John Davin. Hmm. Um, before we go on, because uh, I want to ask about John, who John Davin is a little bit and his contribution to the Synod of Dort, because I think that helps also to to conceptualize that this is actually uh, one of the reform, like one of the guys who's at the, the Reformed Conference that we all think about when we think about Reformed yeah, theology, yeah. held this view and actually made it possible to hold according to the canons of Dort. Um, but before we get there, is there a way that you can define hypothetical universalism sure. in, in just like a minute, even if it's not like the technical sure. one, just like the big picture of what it is? Yeah. Um we probably should talk more about this a little bit, but the, the way that I like to define hypothetical universalism is the belief uh, that Christ died for all 
in such a way that if all believed, all would be saved. In other words, he made an atoning sacrifice for all sin such that if all believed, all would be saved. Now, yeah, we'll have to parse more about, uh, you know, parse that a little bit further as we go. Um, but that's, that's about as good of a definition as you're going to get relative to the phrase hypothetical universalism. Yeah. And I think it's helpful to have, as, at least as like a, something to hook our thoughts on, because I think the word universalism stirs up different thoughts today than, it, than what, what we're talking about. Because universalism yeah. often means, say, everyone's going to be saved eventually. Right. I mean, David is as far away from that as possible. So anyway. well, this is, this is a, just as a big picture statement, too. It's interesting that if I read uh, people before the medieval era and patristic era, I don't really see anyone trying to like say somehow Christ's atonement is is locked in to a very select amount of people. There's a universality to it. And yet everybody's right. affirming that there's a coming judgment where, where they'll be judging the quick and the dead. Sure. So yeah. There, as that seems normal to me. And what you're describing, I, I feel like kind of fits into that. Sure. Yeah. As Davenant puts it, he said, nowhere do we see them like seeming not to want to say that Christ died for all. On the other hand, all of them also emphasize the fact that its application is only to believers. Yeah. Um, right. Um, and, and that's as far as it goes relative to that question. But of course, there are plenty of other questions that we could raise. We could raise about, you know, do they believe in hell? Yes. Uh, do they believe in predestination? At least uh, the doctrine of predestination is held by like uh, the Augustinians later on and the, the, these are questions that, um, you know, historians have wrestled with as well, but Davenant kind of av avoids that with the early church. He doesn't really get into that. Yeah, I don't think you have to get into the weeds, but I think your observation is so true. It's like, I, at least I don't see any discussions where people are trying to say, let's talk about the cross of Christ and, and the atonement as somehow being so narrow that it doesn't include the world in some sense. Yeah. But yeah, the application is always those who are part of the body of Christ. By faith. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's almost like a no-brainer. But sometimes I think our discussions we have today are, are so weird because they almost make the cross seem like it's not what the Bible or Christians have said it was like. And, and the way that you're describing things, at least according to John Davenant, when I hear it, as you're explaining it, it seems to just clinch with what Christians have said frequently in church history. Yeah, th that gets to the subtitle of my book, which is a defense of Catholic and Reformed Orthodoxy, mm. that ca Catholicity. Uh, uh, Dav hypothetical universalism is often uh, is kind of viewed or expressed as being some sort of novel construction. You know, again, trying to be an in-between between, between uh, Calvinism and Arminianism, but uh, the way that Davenant saw it he, he saw himself as holding on to the older way of talking about the subject, whereas he saw some of the reformed as denying that older way of talking about it. Um, and so he's, in, in some ways, he's the quintessential traditionalist on the question, uh, even though that's not the way that it comes across today um, in, in, in the histories. Um, so, yeah. Well, it does seem to me, I think I was talking with, with Mark Jones about this, that when we kind of read our church history, and we, we love the Puritans often, but we're really hearing one stream of Puritans that Banner of Press published. And it's great that they published them. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying we only know that one narrow stream. And so yeah. a lot of times our, our theological censors are according to one tiny group, which are a good group, but don't accurately represent the sort of diversity within the early modern and even scholastic reform tradition. Yeah, I mean, this is even heightened when you realize that the great majority of theology written in the period that we're talking about, the early modern period, was written in Latin, which we're getting nothing of, basically, right? And then when you talk about like Banner of Truth, uh, as much as I'm very happy with the work that they do in republishing these great works, they largely emphasize the nonconformist tradition. Um, so usually Church of England guys aren't published that were reformed, right? Um, and, then, and then also it's English, 
right? Uh, it's English Reformed Orthodoxy as opposed to largely the Dutch tradition or the German Reformed tradition or the French Reformed tradition, etc. And so, yeah, uh, the the more you start to think about how narrow our reading is, and that 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 reading is being um, uh, kind of driven by what publishers find interesting or what they think we'll want to read um, or what they want us to read. Yeah, I mean, but this is true in the early modern period as well, right? Like if you're a theologian in any given context, you're stuck to, to reading whatever is published and whatever you have available to you at that time. And so this is just life, yeah. Well, and it might be a useful note too. I mean, these works are not hidden away anymore. Yep. Most of the earlier form works that I know of, and, and even some medieval ones, are on various online libraries, like the Puritan. What is it? PR. What does that sound for again? PR, yeah, PRDL. Post Reformation yeah. Digital Library, PRDL. Yeah, but well, yeah, but PRDL is just collating them from various libraries. So uh, uh, the German nation has been digitizing all of their public libraries um, and university libraries, and then. We have Internet Archive and Google Books. Yeah, I mean, we have more works available to us than any of these guys had available to them at any given point, right? So that they didn't even often realize how, diver how diverse the Reformed tradition was because they simply didn't have at their disposal the various works written in other places to read. So, I mean, some of them did. D yeah. Don't get me wrong. Some of them did, but many of them did not. So, okay, we talked about how the, the nonconformist group is often privileged, at least in our setting. Um, John Davenant is, I guess you would call him a conformist, right? Was that oh, yeah, 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 totally. He was a, he was a, he was a bishop in the Church of England, uh, Bishop of Salisbury. Yeah, yeah. he was, um, uh, William Laud was his um, archbishop, um, at least later on um, in his ministry. Yeah, he was a he was a Church of England man. And right. yet, I mean, a lot of the guys that we respect are. I mean, even a guy like John Owen was Church of England until near the end of his life, basically, as far as I understand. And that was almost because of necessity, because of uh, all the attempted regicides and him storing weapons in London for a revolution. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. And everything changes in 1660. Um, Too right. Uh, act of is it the Act of Conformity? Um, anyways. But yeah. Um, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, anyways, they're basically demanding that everyone follow the Book of Common Prayer and, and the liturgy of the Church of England. So yeah, anyways, yeah, I mean, William Perkins um, mm -hmm. was a Church of England man. Richard um, Baxter too, right? Uh, early on, yes. Again, I mean, most of these guys, I think uh, I think Baxter notes in his Relinquai Baxteriani, I think that's what it's called. It's his autobiography. He mentions how most of the guys at the Westminster Assembly um, were non were, were basically moderate conformists until they were given un, until basically the interregnum where they were given the freedom not to conform and then all of a sudden they became a nonconformists and many of them get kicked out later on uh, by 1660 um, as I mentioned yeah um, it's much more complicated that that history and the ecclesiology and the doctrine of worship among all of these guys is a bit more complicated as well than is often said right. um, in the period. But Davenant, Davenant, when I say that he's a conformist, when I say he's a Church of England guy, I mean that he had no qualms about the liturgy or the worship or the, the um, ecclesiology of the Church of England. He believed uh, in... Uh, in fact, he was uh, Yuri Divino. He believed in the di divine right of um, of bishopry uh, of the bishopric um, that uh, that the Church of England ought to have bishops and these sorts of things. I mean, he was a defender of the ecclesiology of the Church of England. It might be useful to know just before we dive in is that like today there's roughly 80 million Anglicans across the world, the vast majority of whom are. Even, I don't know if evangelical is the right word, but they are even well, the good kind of evangelical that we think of, uh, authority of scripture, the gospel, all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. where a lot of these other nonconformist groups have, have split over and over and over to the point of numerically being quite small and, and ununited. So there might be an argument 
to conformity given <laughs> given well, its history. Well, this is where I put my historian cap on and say, I'll leave those questions up to theologians or yeah. you know other folk. But yeah, I mean, um, this history is all very complicated. It's at least useful to note the present circumstance because I think some people think if you're if you're if you're a nonconformist tradition like a Baptist, you, you often think, well, the Anglicans are kind of bad, but then you look across the world and it's like, well, no, that's not the case. It's just different. Yes. We all have our problems. I'm a Presbyterian, and so they call us the split peas for good reason. Which are are you? PC, which are you? PCA or uh, OPC? OPC. Okay. Yeah. Um. There's a there's an article I was looking at right before we were talking. It was like an explainer on all the different Presbyterian groups because there are a few. Uh, yeah, PCA, a few PCA. hundred of them probably. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we there's a whole there's all these charts online that you can get of, of <laughs> you know these sorts of things. So yeah. So John Davenant, though, despite what we've just said, he was one of, I think, two delegates from England, maybe more, to the Synod of Dort. Oh, there were more. Yeah, there were uh, five or six oh, okay. memory. Uh, well, you, you said England. There were, I think, five from England and one from Scotland. Mm. Um, anyways, but yes, um, and one of them left and another one had to take its place. Um, but, but, but he's yeah. a central player, at least in this kind of this this kind of history that we view pretty highly in the reformed yes. so world. I haven't given his dates yet. Yeah. Oh, so sorry, he, was, go ahead. he was he was born in 1572. He dies in 1641. He goes to the Synod of Dort in 1618, 1619. King James chooses delegates from the Church of England and one from Scotland, although that the Scotsman is a obviously um, part of the uh, Church of England, even though he lives in Scotland. Um, anyways, he sends them to the Synod of Dort to represent the Church of England. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I think it's there too. Might be like there, there's a really close relationship at this time with the Netherlands and England. Like they're are they are they formal allies? They're at least very close in. Sure. There there's uh, there's been some formal treaties. Like uh, I think one of them is called the Treaty of Non Such. Uh, I pro I'm probably saying that wrong, um, but anyways, um, yes, they had they had strong ties, um, uh, both economically and politically. Um, and King James is very interested in a Netherlands that is united, Protestant, and that is closely allied to the Church of England's theology, um, and the theology in the Church of England at that time is Calvinistic. So he's interested in that, yeah. So how much of a say would John Davenant have had in the sort of arguments of theology at, the, at Dort? Like, Well, there's, there's two things to note. Um, he is not um, the bishop at the time uh, that he would become after the Synod of Dort. He is something of second in command as a delegate. Um, if you were to rank the delegates, um, um, he, he, he's second in command underneath the bishop that was sent to the Synod of Dort along with him and others. Um, um, but because he's a, he, he, was, he was the only professor sent uh, among the English delegates at Dort, he was, he was Lady Margaret Professor of Theology, uh, Theology at Cambridge at the time. And so, therefore, he is seen to be the theologian, right? He may not be the churchman um, at the time, but he is the theologian of the English delegates at Dort. And the English delegates, because King James is basically funding the, the, the Synod of Dort, uh. um, there is a lot of desire and demand that the Dutch church recognize and prioritize what the, um, what the Church of England says ought to be and not to be in these articles. Now, this creates a problem when the Church of England has its own interests in mind that the, that the, uh, that the Dutch church does not. For example, the Dutch church is interested in arguing for episcopacy at the Synod of Dort. They are interested in not 
overly upsetting the Lutherans um, at the at the Synod of Dort. Whereas the Dutch don't, see, well, they're definitely not interested in arguing for ep episcopacy. They aren't as interested in appeasing any of the Lutherans. And so therefore there are these desires or the, or the 39 articles are being in conformity with the 39 articles, right? So um, King James expressly gives Davenant and the rest of the delegates, he says, do not argue or support anything that is against our, our uh, confessional documents, the 39 articles, the Book of Common Prayer, et cetera. Uh, whereas the, you know, the, the, the Dutch church has no need to defend or to, to be within those bounds. Um, and so this, this often comes into conflict and it came into significant conflict when they were arguing against, or when they were arguing about the second uh, main doctrine at the Synod of Dort, which is on the ex extent of the atonement. So what were the, the two kind of sides as it were on the question? Uh, well, at the, at the Synod, um, there's the remonstrant position. Um, and among the remonstrants, I identify in my book at least a couple different versions of that. Um, and then um, among the delegates, there were a basically, there were basically three different views. One view was what I call the Piscatorian view, Johann Piscator. Uh, his position and others at the at, at, at Dort was that Christ only died for the elect. We don't even like the language of Christ dying for all in any sort of way, right? So these guys, just Christ died for the elect, period. Then um, I would say the majority position at Dort were this dying position. Uh, what I, I, I say it's dying, but because by 1650, you don't have a lot of reform people arguing this position, but it, but it, it was kind of alive and well at Dort. And it was a position that on the one hand wanted to affirm what is called the Lombardian formula language that Christ died for all with regard to the sufficiency of the price, uh, with, with regard to the sufficiency of Christ's death and its value for all. But then, so they wanted to affirm the Lombardian language. And then they go, and later on in their writings, and they're talking about this question, say Christ only died for the elect. So on the one hand, they were saying Christ died for all in a certain way. And then they were going and saying, but he only died for the elect. And that they seemingly had no problem saying both of those things. It wasn't Christ died for the elect alone in a certain way. It was Christ only died for the elect. But we want to affirm whatever was kind of medieval and bequeathed to us. Um, and then there was the Davenant position, which the Davenant position was he died for all in a certain sense, and he died for the elect alone in a certain sense. And those two senses are different, they're non-contradictory, and we want to hold to them both. Um, it was kind of a very clear Christ died for all, yes. Christ died for the elect, yes. Alone for the elect, in a certain sense. Uh, but here are the senses, and that, that's what Davenant's hypothetical universalism is trying to do. I could get into more of the weeds, but those are the three sort of reform positions and what they came up with arguing uh, at the at Dort, you know, your canons that you get today, your canons are an affirmation that he died for the the elect alone in a certain sense. That affirmation, with no real discussion about, they they do not affirm that he died for the uh, for the non-elect in any way, so they don't affirm it nor do they deny it. They just avoid the question and they say what everyone agrees on, namely that the death of Christ is a sufficient atonement. Everyone agreed with that. All the reformed, all the, every, every theologian agreed that there was an intrinsic eternal value to the death of Christ. And so that's what it affirms. So it affirms that 
that satisfies everyone at Dort. And then it affirms that which everyone agreed with at Dort, namely, So we're returning, we had a, a technical glitch, but Michael, you're explaining how at the end of the day, the article really only affirmed that it was a sufficient death for the elect, but it said uh, very little about uh, any, anything else, the kind of universality of it. Yeah, so, yo, okay. So it says that it's a sufficient atonement for, right? Uh, it's of infinite value. It affirms that, but then it also affirms the proposition that Christ, this is the this is the anti-remonstrant proposition mm -hmm. that the remonstrants would have wanted to deny, namely that in the intention of the death of Christ itself, Christ actually offered himself for the elect in a way that he did not offer himself for the non-elect. He merited uh, the gift of faith, the Holy Spirit. He uh, merited regeneration and all these divine gifts, these saving gifts for the elect alone, right? This is something that the remonstrants were basically universally denying. And so that's that's what allows Davenant and someone like Futsius at the Synod of Dort to agree, right? They all agreed that that was what was needing to be affirmed. I just think, um, or I was just noting that it does not really address the relation that the death of Christ has to the non-elect, it kind of just avoids that because if it gets into that, there's going to be disagreement. So maybe just a, a, a question of clarification. So does the Synod want to clarify that these merits are for the elect, uh, the, the participants there because of, basically because of predestination? Because when I think yeah. about just in history, it's like, well, of course, if you believe, then you participate in the gifts of salvation. Well, but if you okay, don't believe, yeah. you don't. Right. So yes, I mean, it is driven partly by their doctrine of predestination, but it's also being driven by the Bible. They read things like, um, they read all the uh, particular texts, like John 17, him, uh, um, 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 or John 6, him dying, for, or John 10, dying for the sheep. Right. Or um, even John Davenant reads the new covenant um, as being made with the elect before time, as it were. Right. The new covenant uh, in Christ's blood. Like uh, he reads the new covenant language in Hebrews and in Jeremiah 31 as the new covenant made with the elect. Um, so he has even a uh, pactum salutis where um, th there are two covenants. Uh, there are actually three covenants for Davenant. One is um, the covenant of works, uh, which, which everyone knows about, presumably. Uh, but then there are, there's the covenant of grace, uh, or what we might call the new covenant. Uh, that's the language you find in, um, in uh, Jeremiah 31. And he says, properly speaking, that's made between Christ and the Father before time, and it includes all the elect. And it's this covenant that basically Christ is going to be the mediator for the elect um, and do this mediatorial work for the elect. He also has what's called a universal covenant. This is the covenant language that we find in um, um, like John 3.16, John 3.17, uh, John 3.18, uh, where you get this whole Christ is dying for all such that if all believed, all would be saved. If you repent, you will believe. He calls this, he calls this a universal covenant made with all human beings on account of the universal aspect of Christ's death. He died for all such that if all believed, all would be saved. And this is kind of at the heart of his hypothetical universalism. Yeah. So there's, there's two sides. So I, maybe just to take one step back to ask you some of the context. Um, the first part of the, of the explanation, you know, Christ, that the father and son made an agreement, the son would die you know, for the elect in time. Yes. When you say that, at the face, I know there's explanation at the face of it, it sounds pretty kind of scary because what it sounds like it, is God created the mass of humanity for the purpose of letting them go to hell. So like my, my, yeah. my so I, I know there's more to it, but like just to give you yeah. one example my daughter sometimes asks me 
why did God create Satan to hurt us? <laughs> Or if he knew that he would hurt us. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's one of those questions where it's like, I know there's explanations behind it, but on, on like, can you kind of contextualize that? Because I think yeah. without Davenant's other side of the explanation, it sounds a little bit like scary, you know? Well, yeah. So putting aside for a moment that the Odyssey question, which Davenant only treats very, uh, he does not treat it um, um, in any sort of long fac- fashion. He doesn't write on it much, although he deals with it a little bit in De Morte Christi. Putting that aside for a moment, um, uh, it, it's important to realize he, he is an infralapsarian, which means that uh, when we're talking about a la- predestination of human beings and this covenant, it is assuming the fall. Um, it's assuming fallen human beings. God chooses to make a covenant with a part of humanity in which he gives them the grace by which they would be infallibly saved. Now, we can then get into the the question, you know, that your daughter and others ask, and Davenant actually addresses this question in some detail. Well, why is it that he makes a covenant with only a a covenant which is going to infallibly save only a certain amount of people with the, uh, uh, um, uh, why does he make this covenant and not with all? And he'll argue for God's greater glory to show the magnificence of his benefits, to show that God doesn't, uh, there's no uh, right, uh, no, there's no, there's nothing compelling God to save all and all of these sorts of things, uh, which I which I think, and David even says when he addresses these things that we're 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 hitting up against mystery. Um, we're hitting up against God's sovereignty to where we as potters don't have rights to say to, or no, we as the clay don't have rights to say to the potter, why did you make me this way? And these sorts of things. And Davenant would totally go there at a certain point. Um, God has the freedom to do what he wants with his grace. And we have no absolutely, uh, he actually, this is one of his theses. If, if you read his De Morta Christi, this is one of his main theses uh, that he argues that there is nothing compelling God to give grace to any human being, all right? It is completely out of his liberality. He is completely free in that. And so, yeah, so, and I think the Bible teaches this, right? It's not just a, philo- uh, uh, a philosophical kind of uh, response to other theorems, right? This isn't, or this isn't a theological doctrine that's just purely built off of other theology. Mm-hmm. They believe that there are proof texts for this stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, I remember, so Calvin has the basically the same answer. He says, it's, it's mystery. I don't know. God's incomprehensible. F- funnily enough, though, then he'll explain a lot more after he says that. So. <laughs> right, right, right. right. And Davenant, Davenant gives three reasons. It's in my book. There, 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 is a, there is a bit in my book where I actually talk about the three reasons that he gives, uh, Davenant gives in his treatise. Yeah. So from my point of view, um, and maybe you would agree or disagree, you can let me know what you think. When I, when I see these discussions, I think it's useful to remember this is a specific time in history and an idiom of theology that was very, very relevant to that setting. So it's, it's not like I would argue this with my five-year-old daughter. It's not really like, is a totally different kind of idiom and purpose behind why they might be doing this in Dort in 16, 17, 18. Yes. Yeah, uh, that's true. And right, there's biblical idiom. There's pastoral idiom, there's theological idiom, and then what I would say, there's polemical theological idiom, right? And all of these idioms play a a, a different role, right? So pastoral idiom talks about, oftentimes talks about the liberality and the freeness of the gospel, right? Biblical idiom, well, biblical idiom... um, talks in ways in which both Christ seems to be dying for the elect and Christ dying for all. And so 
that's mm -hmm. where you get the theological idiom of what does this language actually mean? And then polemical idiom is trying to s express things in ways that excludes certain positions and includes other positions, right? And so, yeah, the way that you talk to your daughter isn't gonna be the way that the Synod of Dort perhaps talks about the death of Christ. And if you're talking to your daughter, your five-year-old daughter, or however old she is, about uh, if you're reading her the Canons of Dort, um, there are probably there are probably better things to read to her than than the Canons mm -hmm. of Dort on the subject, you know. So, so yeah. So is uh, um, uh, Davenant's language trying to account for texts that say like Christ is the savior of all men? I think First Timothy two, two four, or Second yeah. Peter three, where Christ or God rather desires all men to be saved. Is, is he yeah, trying to account for both that, of those? Yeah, um, yeah, or like 1 John 2, 2, he's the propitiation of the, the whole, whole world. world. The, yeah, all of John 3, 16, actually he thinks his argument in De Morta Christi is that, um, he, that if you agree with his exegesis on th John 3, 16, he says that everything else follows from it. In <laughs> other words, he thinks, he thinks, that, uh, he thinks that John 3, 16 is the best, Capitul uh, is kind of the best um, uh, proof text for his position. So, so is he a 17th century Billy Graham? Uh, <laughs> yes, except that he wants to strongly affirm that Christ died for the elect alone in a way that he didn't die for the non-elect, which I'm, I'm pretty confident that Billy Graham, that really never came out in his preaching. Um, yeah, um, yes, that's the, yeah, I think there are two impulses in Davenant. And I think that it, I, I think that one of these impulses we just don't sympathize enough with, or that we don't we don't. It, he's not been given enough uh, uh, focus um, on one of these impulses. The one impulse, as you said, is Bible. What the what he thinks the Bible teaches. But of course, every theologian in the period has that impulse. Here's another impulse that other theologians, Reformed theologians definitely do not have. And that is a desire not to go further or not to deny that which was bequeathed to him. And for him, that is what we might call in kind of historical lingo, the Lombardian formula. So Peter of Lombard, the great uh, um, um, master, as they called him, who uh, wrote kind of um, the, the scholastic textbook that Aquinas and many of Duns Scotus and many of these other later scholastic, medieval scholastic theologians commented on. Um, Peter Lombard has a section in his um, uh, commentary where he, um, uh, he, he, he expresses he talks about Christ being the high priest. Uh, he, was, he was our high priest um, for the sake of all and for the sake of the elect. And then he says, he was our high priest. He died as our high priest for all insofar as the sufficiency of the death of Christ is concerned. And then he says, he was our high priest. He died as our high priest for the elect alone, insofar as the efficacy of the death of Christ is concerned. And that sort of language, which actually you can find as far back as, well, Davenant thought it was Ambrose, but what it actually is, is Prosper, who was um, perhaps Augustine's most important disciple, and was a it was was a very strong defender of Augustinianism against um, it's this Prosper of Aquitaine. He was a, um, uh, a a strong defender of Augustinianism against the Semi-Pelagians. Um, he he uses almost the exact same language um, about Christ dying for all, and then Christ dying for the elect alone in two different senses. Davenant is trying to give full. A, a full-throated affirmation of both of those aspects in which you have in the early modern period are Lutherans and Remonstrants 
who are undermining the latter part of that, Christ dying for the elect alone, in a certain sense. So Lutherans and, and Arminians are undermining that, and so Davenant's trying to defend that. That's what you get at the at Dort in the canons, a full-throated defense of how it is that Christ died for the elect alone in a certain way, namely effectually, lamely, insofar as he uh, merited all these to-be-applied benefits, uh, uh, saving benefits to the elect alone. And then on the other hand, he's trying to get a, give a full-throated defense of what it means for Christ to die for all men in a certain way sufficiently. And what he means by that is Christ actually intended that Christ make a satisfaction for the sins of all men, die for them, such, make a universal remedy for, this, for sins such that if all believed, all would be saved. He's trying to give a full-throated affirmation of all of that while affirming the other side. And he's saying that's, that's what's been bequeathed to us that's what the earlier Reformed theologians had been affirming. Calvin, Melanchthon, yes, he included Melanchthon in, as a Reformed theologian. Uh, Bootser, um, uh, Musculus, Zonke, all of these guys he thinks held to that position. And it's only these, his contemporaries, basically, who are starting to undermine that, uh, that first part of the Lombardian formula. He just wants to hold both of them. Now, the reason that you have the later Reformed theologians denying the first part of the Lombardian formula is honestly, they think it's either contradicting the second part of the Lombardian formula or that it's simply not true. It's incoherent or just flat out unbiblical. This is where John Owen goes. John Owen explicitly takes the Lombardian formula language. He says, this is what's been bequeathed to them. He says, if that language is, he says, that language is false. And then what he does is he says, if we modify the language to say it this way, then it's true. And of course, he modifies it in the way that most of the reform, many of the reformed post davenant modify it to where it denies any intentionality. Christ doesn't die for all. It's only that the death of Christ is sufficient for all, but there's no intentionality of Christ actually coming for the non-elect in any way. He's not sent as a high priest for all in any way. He is not the high priest of all in any sense, mm. right? So yeah, so, for Owen and some of these later guys. On one of my earlier uh, podcasts, I talked with, talk with Crawford Gribben, who's a John yeah. Owen scholar. Yes. He actually made the point, if I remember right, that 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 the death of death and the death of Christ is one of John Owen's earlier works. Oh, oh, wait. Later, he's not really. It's not really, like he doesn't necessarily believe what he wrote when he was a kid, kind of thing. He's certainly he's certainly more. Dogmatic. I'm overstating. Yeah. No. 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 Uh, it's true. Um, he's certainly more dogmatic. Um. Yeah, there. I, I could talk more about Owen and some of the earlier Owen and later Owen stuff. I don't think he ever actually changes his mind on the extent of the atonement. Uh, in fact, I'm very confident he does not. However, he does lighten um, the kind of anti, those that are reformed that are arguing for um, kind of an, a Davenantian way of talking about things. When he addresses people later on, I'm thinking in particular of a guy that is, uh, uh, his name is, uh, he wrote a, a book on the decree of God. He has a whole section arguing for what basically is Davenant's hypothetical universalism. Mm -hmm. And Owen's like, I wish you would have sent me this before you published it. He's like, uh, he writes a preface lauding the book praising it. He says, I wish you would have sent me this. I think we disagree more about words than we degree, disagree in substance. Well, that is not the way he talks about Davenant's treatise as a young man when he publishes The Death of Death. Uh, actually, it's The Death of Christ, which he writes like a year or two after he writes The Death of Death. There does seem to be a different uh, polemical feistiness in early Owen that you don't see in the later Owen, which is quite fascinating. Can, can yeah. you imagine that a young man 
might be feisty and then become less so as he gets older? Yeah, there's almost, it's almost like cage stage Calvinism was yeah. a thing even back then, yeah. Yeah, I, no, I mean, yeah. Yeah, Owen is super, you read uh, his earliest work, his thing on Arminianism, it's uh, not an antidote. Like antidote to it or something, right? Yeah, antidote to Arminianism or something like that. And anyways, I don't know. it is, <clears throat> it is, you would think he thinks the remonstrance come from the pit of hell. Um, now, <laughs> some of them may have, very well have. Um, I, I, I speak as a historian though, and just say that that's the way he presents some of them early on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's interesting. Um, as you kind of close down here, uh, so I'll put your book and like the show notes and all that kind of stuff. But what I think, I think a lot of people hearing this have probably like me learned a lot, but are really interested to learn more. So I, I know that your book is a place to go to figure out what the Lombardian formula really is all about. Yeah. And yeah. what's going on with John Davenant. Are there other, like, what else can we read, like maybe by John Davenant that's maybe accessible? I know there's an English translation of his Justification uh, book, which yep. is accessible. Like what other kind of things are out there? So, so, so Davenant, um, he wrote one, am I right to say only one work in English? No, he wrote two works in English. He wrote a book on trying to pacify, or arguing for the unity of the Lutheran and Reformed churches. Um, that was in English. Um, I, I, I ran a come, uh, is that what it's called? Anyways, um, he also wrote a, a book called Animate Versions, which was against a uh, Arminianizing English theologian uh, uh, named, or uh, English theologian named Samuel Horde. And it's called Animate Versions. It's against his book, um, Samuel Horde's book. And it's basically a good place to go to get Davenant on predestination and reprobation. He talks a lot about it, although there's a lot of Latin in it. He'll just like quote people randomly in Latin all the time. Um, uh, yeah, so in terms of translations, his De Morta Christi, actually, you can go read. There's a 19th century translation of his On the Death of Christ, which argues his position on hypothetical universalism. Um, the, there's kind of a couple of problems with the translation. One, it's just 19th century. Two, there, there are some mistakes, but you know, you, you can go find it. You can learn a lot. I find that people that are uninitiated to the world uh, that he's like writing in find him quite difficult. And that's true. He wrote the treatise in Latin, which means he only, he only intended it to be written by people that already knew the polemical debates of the period, right? And so he's already entering into a conversation that none of us are in. Our, our, our own context is not that context at all in any way. Um, so you can read that. His work on justification, which is really a defense on the relationship to good works and justification, uh, which is a phenomenal uh, defense of the reform doctrine of justification and how good works relate to justification and these sorts of things. Um, there are also, uh, um, he wrote um, these disputations, these questions, this, these disputed questions, they were translated into English in the 19th century that largely deal with Roman Catholicism and they're polemical. Um, so like he has one against the Jesuits, he has some on, um, he, he defends his uh, uh, infralapsarianism. He, def uh, he uh, goes after prayers to the dead and all these sorts of things. These were lectures that he gave at Cambridge as a professor uh, there at the University of Cambridge. And they were published uh, in the 17th century in Latin. And then they were um, republished or they were translated in the 19th century. You can find those, they're appended to the second volume of the English translation uh, of justification, his book on justification. It's the second volume. You can see uh, the, the full, those, those lectures are all there. Um, it was a separate work that they just put together. Uh, his, oh, but most famously, and this is easy, um, the easiest thing to get your hands on today of Davenant, speaking of banner of truth and what they do and do not publish, they publish his commentary on Colossians in the Geneva commentary series. Um, and so, um, I have it over here, if, um, here. So 
this massive volume. It's like the biggest commentary. Um, it's his, it was originally in Latin again. So it would have been, uh, they were actually lectures again that he gave at Cambridge to students of theology, right? Um, but uh, there, it's his commentary on Colossians. And it's an, I would say it's the best entry to the theology of Davenant. Like overall, you will get a good sense of what he's all about. Yeah. And then beyond it. beyond your book, are there any other like secondary sources that are like top of the game on him? Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, Muller writes about Davenant a little bit, and I, I recommend everything that Muller writes in his Calvin and the Reformed tradition that mm -hmm. I have somewhere over here. Um, yeah, so, but not really. I, my, my dissertation is the full, 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 is the first full dissertation just on Davenant that's mm. ever been published. <laughs> yeah, so there's not a lot of places to go. You know, there are some places to get, you know, talk, talk about hypothetical universalism. But um, my recommendation is, you know, if you're not going to read my book, which is, you know, not the cheapest thing in the world to buy, um, you know, to, to go read, just read widely, read carefully, read critically. Um, and, uh, remember you need to do the work of a historian before you do the work of a theologian. If not, you'll read these people with skewed kind of lenses, right? When I go to Owen, when I go to Davenant, when I go to Futsius, when I go to Beza, I read them as men of their time first. And then perhaps at the end, I'll give a theological judgment on what I think about what they're saying. But if you really want to understand them, you have to, you have to put yourself in their world as much as you can and kind of read them on their own. That's the, that's the Mueller way. And that's the way I've been taught to do history. Oh, well, that's fun. Uh, thank you, Michael. I'll, so we'll link your book and I'll hopefully have some recourse to read it. Maybe when it comes to a library or maybe I can get it sometime this fall is it uh it's hardcover well do they do paperback in that series that you have uh i do believe eventually it will go to paperback okay. um and then you should be able to get it at quite a bit cheaper of a price um but they uh you can also get it on kindle and some other way in some other ways like that um i know people already have digital copies of it one way or another um not, not no i i mean legally like oh. um, as soon as it came out they, it was sent to their nook or whatever else. Okay, yeah. Right. Um, and usually that's at a cheaper price. Like I think I saw like for Barnes and Noble is like at seventy four dollars, which well, is cheaper than a hundred bucks. So, you know. Anyway, so hopefully the price will go down. But um, remember, you can go to your public library mm. or your university library, and you can ask them to get it. They have budgets for these things, and oftentimes people don't they don't use that money because no one recommends what they should buy. So go ask your public library. You'd be Actually, amazed what your local public library will yeah. buy. If I remember right, my, li my public library too has agreements with universities. So you can also get it from interlibrary loan from an academic library. So totally. there's lots of ways to access stuff that we don't always look into. So yeah, you, there should be absolutely, given the fact that it's published by Oxford University <laughs> Press, there should be no w reason why you can't get it for free somehow, you know, in, in terms of like through a live interlibrary loan or your public library, just getting it. So and then when it comes to soft cover, you can buy it for 40 bucks or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And then I would also note that oftentimes during the summertime, Oxford University Press and some of these university presses run like 50% discounts on all their books. Right. So just watch, I, I follow them on Twitter. You follow them on Facebook and just, pay attention, keep your eyes out open. They run deals. They really do. And you can, you, you just wait for the deals. I said this before, but you can either buy um, kind of two mediocre books and you feel like you're getting a good deal because you get two, or you buy one expensive one that's really useful. And so sometimes you can kind of balance your priorities and uh, it's worth buying the expensive book if you know it to be good. Yeah. Well, and I won't speak to whether or not my book is good or not, but I, I, I think the advice is wise. Uh, if, if, if you have a limited budget and you're the person that's actually interested in these topics, 
you should prioritize primary and secondary literature over tertiary literature any day of the week, right? Those which are close, those things that interact most closely with the primary literature, you should be most interested in. Mm. Thanks, Michael. I appreciate you talking with me. Yeah, thanks, Wyatt.